There is a mod for Red Dead Redemption 2 that lets you play as any animal in the game's ecosystem. And it is, quite literally, a transformative experience. With this mod, I tore through a town as a deer, and I raced through the grass as a mountain lion, and I soared through the skies as an eagle. And through it all, I gained a new understanding of a world I thought I was already deeply familiar with. I knew this virtual ecosystem was vibrant, but by changing my perspective, I realized it's alive. Some worlds feel like they exist long before you press play. When a game pulls this off, the results can be breathtaking, and sometimes even a little uncanny. So let's discover what makes a digital ecosystem truly seem to have a life of its own. Even without mods that expand your perspective, the world of Red Dead is obsessively detailed. Snow realistically falls from branches as you wander past, the eyes of owls glow in the dark. Depending on the ambient temperature, there's realistic growth and shrinkage of your horses. Okay, we're skipping that. But it proves my point. This game's commitment to environmental minutia is absurd. Which is probably why playing as an animal genuinely feels like a kind of existential voyage. I don't want to over-exaggerate, but I mean it when I say this game is so immersive, it's hard not to lose yourself within each new perspective. Every animal made me see the ecosystem a different way, and reevaluate my position within it. Inhabiting different roles in an ecosystem is even more essential to a game like Lost Ember. Developed by an indie studio, the entire experience revolves around changing forms, choosing the perfect time to transfer your consciousness into a different link in the food chain. You play as a soul wanderer, a reincarnated spirit that can periodically take over the bodies of nearby life forms to navigate a hostile environment. It's a little tricky to get the hang of at first, but the more you practice, the more natural it becomes to constantly be changing between different modes of existence. No two species feel the same. Being a wombat is a leisurely experience, while being a hummingbird is frantic, fitting for an animal with a heart that beats over a thousand times per minute. And since every creature has their own terrain they're adept at navigating, you can never settle into one form for too long. Like in Red Dead, the multiple perspectives give you a greater understanding of the larger ecosystems, to the point where it's impossible to imagine the game without this mechanic. But here's what's weird. The shape-changing feature isn't actually supposed to be in Red Dead at all. And yet, like Lost Ember, it feels fundamental. For example, while playing this mod, I realized that every bird takes off slightly differently. It even seems that heavy species like condors can't take off directly from the ground, and need a realistically elevated position to soar through the skies. But pretty much the only time you see birds in this game is from a great distance on horseback, so why include these intricacies? This mod doesn't add any animations, all these elements were here in the base game, just waiting to be uncovered. Each bird also has a distinctive flight pattern, except for bats, which have their own, completely unique flight system. I didn't even know there were bats in this game, I've never seen one before. I've beaten it twice! What compels a studio to focus this much on tiny details? Details that the vast majority of players are never going to uncover. If any game can help us answer that question, it has to be Dwarf Fortress, quite possibly the most labyrinthine and complicated title ever conceived. The product of almost 20 years of work by a pair of brothers, every time you press start, the game generates a new world. Calculating rainfall and mineral distribution and temperature and elevation and a hundred other things. You can watch thousands of years of simulated history flicker by, a timeline of events generated in the top corner chronicling wars and treaties and betrayals and losses, and that's just the abridged version. The full history of my first game included 525,086 events, all before I started playing. Trying to actually beat Dwarf Fortress is potentially even more complicated. But I think that bewildering intricacy is the point to an extent. In the original text-based game, you manage countless entities represented by letters, which can be overwhelming, but also mesmerizing. 
I know I'll never fully comprehend this gargantuan bio-network, but that just makes it feel more like an actual world, the kind of ecosystem you could spend a lifetime studying. Of course, you could also spend a lifetime studying the smallest ecosystem. Ant Simulation is the pinnacle of specificity. Created by YouTuber Peza, it's incredible how thoroughly this project replicates the movements of real insects. Every simulated worker leaves behind a chemical path just like in nature to guide their nestmates to sources of food. Two different colonies of ants will fight over the same resources, the conflict realistically breaking off into numerous skirmishes. Ant Simulator doesn't boast thousands of years of lore like Dwarf Fortress, and yet the interactions feel no less important, proving that a micro-world can be just as impactful as a macro one. This is true in other digital ecosystems as well. There's a reason why players are so excited to find Ants in Skyrim, a title where you regularly fight dragons. Sometimes, it's the smallest details that make an ecosystem feel alive. Take mud, for instance. Okay, hear me out on this. The mud in Red Dead is beautiful. The way people and animals and carts all leave tracks through it adds so much to the environments. If you accidentally fall into the mud, it gets all over your clothes. It seems so physical. Which is why I was surprised to learn it's flat. And not just flat because it's on a TV screen. I mean flat compared to the rest of the game's 3D rendering. People have gone into the files and discovered this mud is just a 2D texture, with the deep footprints all a clever optical illusion. And that's not a bad thing. You can't really render a virtual ecosystem on current hardware without carefully allocating resources. But I think it's a noteworthy paradox that many of the worlds that feel most alive are constantly culling things out. The beautiful, rippling grasses of games like Tears of the Kingdom can only exist because the world is lowering the quality of plants that are further away. In fact, for most modern games, any part of the terrain that isn't within the player's immediate cone of vision is being constantly rendered out. And again, I want to make it clear none of these techniques are bad. Without them, most digital ecosystems couldn't exist at all. So why is it that I feel slightly uneasy when I learn that a game like Insomniac Spider-Man contains thousands, tens of thousands, of false environments? The vast majority of interiors you can see through windows in this game are illusions, completely flat images like Red Dead's mud, made to look full of depth through a clever trick of programming. It's a conceit that makes total sense. New York in this game is an urban ecosystem just as detailed as any biological one. There's no way the developers could render every single apartment. I know that. And yet there's still something strange to me about peering into a space and knowing it's not there. This strangeness isn't unique to game environments. Movies have been using similar techniques for decades creating numerous fantastical ecosystems through well-placed flat images. The traditional film method for creating imagined environments was the matte painting, which was combined with live-action footage in the days before CGI. The original Star Wars trilogy made use of techniques like this a lot, with numerous scenes merging sets with paintings in ways that are almost impossible to notice. It really is something of a lost world-building art. It's likely you've seen some landscapes in movies you haven't even realized were paintings. Even still, you might have felt something was off, a slight nagging sense of unreality. And of course, in some cases, it's easier to tell than others, with the very seams visible if you look closely. The seams in virtual ecosystems typically aren't as obvious, but you can spot them too if you know what to look for. Any moment in a modern game that requires you to stop and move through a tight space is probably buying time to load in the next area. This strategy is honestly pretty clever, and shows how carefully streamlined virtual worlds have to be. Maybe that's why when a game includes useless details, like ants or overly specific flight animations, it feels so revelatory. Like you turned around too fast, and instead of catching the seams, you caught the game being alive in a way it shouldn't. This is a huge part of why the ecosystem of a game like Rain World seems to have a life of its own. In that title, creature interactions are simulated even when you aren't on screen, which means you'll constantly stumble upon unfolding dramas that have nothing to do with your journey. 
It feels like the world simply exists far beyond the confines of the camera. If there's a film equivalent to this kind of environment, it's probably the expansive 360 degree physical set, which are becoming increasingly rare. Though less practical than a static backdrop or green screen, these types of sets have a total immersion quality I find extremely compelling. These are worlds that people actually built and walked through. Like the Roman form from the film Cleopatra, an absolutely monstrous construction that bankrupted the studio. Its proportions were more than double that of the actual Roman form, and since this film was a financial bomb, it's also something of a monument to the hubristic end of old Hollywood, a historical site in its own right, though not one that survived to present day. I also think of the Atoll set from Waterworld, which was a quarter mile in circumference. Production of this movie reportedly swallowed up every piece of steel in Hawaii, requiring more to be flown in from California. This film was also a financial bomb. You might question what such anecdotes have to do with video game ecosystems, but I think there's a real commonality across these obsessive attempts at crafting convincing fictional environments. Perhaps it's a natural creative inclination to chase the dream of an imagined world without boundary. It can also, clearly, be disastrous, and even dangerous. At what point does a fictional world stop being fictional? This is a question essential to the production of Dao. What began as a single movie turned into a two-year-long experiment where over a thousand actors and extras lived in a closed-off replica of Cold War-era Russia. Whether on or off camera, the people on set had to remain fully in character, working actual jobs for period-appropriate currency. This Truman Show-like simulation was 12,000 square miles, the largest set ever built in Europe, and the institutional corruption the movie grapples with reportedly spilled over into life on the set, with allegations of mistreatment surrounding the production. And despite all these efforts to create an authentic setting, the movie isn't even supposed to be very good. Did you know that there's over a thousand unique characters in Red Dead? The vast majority exist in the background, full-time extras in a digital set, their sole purpose to make the environments you walk through more lifelike. Yet if you decide to follow one throughout their day, you'll find most of these digital people have a full daily routine. They wake up each morning and go to work. Some toil away for long hours, others slack off when they can. When night falls, people amble home at different speeds. Some have families to get back to, Others seem achingly lonely. Early in this video, I said that worlds that seem like they exist before you press play can feel uncanny. Red Dead's world, with its almost unhinged devotion to realism, can certainly fall into that category. Left unchecked, the pursuit of a living fictional world can be a kind of madness. You can see this quite plainly across the multi-decade career of game designer Peter Molyneux. A founding influence in the so-called god game genre, his projects frequently give you command of not just ecosystems, but entire worlds, and are usually ambitious to the point of collapsing under their own weight. The Cleopatras and water worlds of gaming. There's a reason why not many other studios have even attempted to make games like this. Trying to make worlds at this level of complexity can often lead to setbacks and broken promises. That said, a part of me sympathizes with how Molyneux's desire to create outpaces what he can actually produce. The wildly anticipated fable famously claimed players could plant an acorn and watch it grow into a tree over the course of the game, a feature that had to be cut in the final version. The game Yonder the Cloud Catcher Chronicles was not produced by Molyneux. Yet as writer Matt Paprocki points out in his review of the title, in that game, you actually can watch acorns grow into trees. Which is impressive, because Yonder is a small indie project, but one with a strong sense of the kind of world it wants to build. The map is tiny, the creature variety limited, yet Yonder's ecosystem feels more fully realized than many big-budget titles. I think it's an intriguing contrast to Dao-style megaprojects suggesting that not all worlds need a thousand layers of detail to feel alive. Do Red Dead's intricacies make the game better? 
I mean, don't get me wrong, they certainly do part of the time. These might be the most stunning environments I've ever had the pleasure of exploring. But on the other hand, sometimes the excess feels like, well, excess. I think one detail in particular sums up this dichotomy the best, and it's probably one you've never noticed. The stars in Red Dead shine ever so slightly more brightly in the wilderness than they do in urban areas. Which is accurate, but also, what a detail to include! On the one hand, it seems crazy to bother with adding such a subtle real-world imperfection. But on the other hand, I think it's kind of perfect. Because Red Dead Redemption 2 isn't just a game about exploring a breathtaking world. It's also about the end of one. Rapid industrialization changed the very landscape of the United States. Expanding cities and railways replaced forests and fields, destroying and displacing indigenous communities. All these themes are present in the game's lengthy story, but they're also present in the land itself. Even when you're not in a city, there's a transient quality to the game's ecosystems. A sense that none of this will remain as it is. Not even the stars. I felt this dimming of a natural era most strongly when inhabiting the perspective of animals. Which is again, really weird, because none of that is meant to be in the game. But trying to steer a buffalo through an urban area is so visually and mechanically powerful. It instills a feeling in your animal bones that this is a world that no longer belongs to you. Maybe it's silly to read this much into a fan-made add-on. But I think it's a testament to how thorough this world is that it can serve as a canvas for experiences the developers never intended. Having said all this, I do think there needs to be some kind of reckoning with the fact that these ecosystems don't always work perfectly. I've recorded a lot of game footage for this channel, and one thing I always edit out are glitches. Moments where creatures freak out or just behave in an unusual manner. Even the most impressive virtual biospheres have these sorts of hiccups. When it comes to immersion, glitches are almost universally regarded as a negative. But in a strange way, I think they can sometimes make a world feel more realistic. Nature doesn't always act rationally. Just look at the Comedy Wildlife Photography Awards, a contest where the top nature photographers share photos of animals essentially glitching out. Animals aren't always perfect at being animals in real life, so it's kind of fitting the same is true in the virtual realm. For example, I had a lot of trouble recording footage of bears in Red Dead for this video, because some problem with their code meant they would just not do what I wanted. But I think that's kind of appropriate. Bears don't like doing what people tell them to. They're bears. I'm not sure any ecosystem embodies the playful side of nature better than the one in Alba, a wildlife adventure. The final title I want to discuss today, Alba is something of the spiritual and mechanical opposite of a game like Red Dead. Its world is bright and stylized instead of grim and realistic. Instead of playing as an outlaw, you play as a kid trying to document all the animals on an island. And the map itself is really tiny, a carefully curated slice of life. You even have a little book full of all the wildlife you can find. It's really charming. Which is why it's a surprise to learn that this world too is coming to an end. You find out early on in the game that all these environments will be replaced to make room for a hotel development. And as you might imagine, this world's fate isn't as unalterable as the fate of the United States in Red Dead. I mean, it's a kid's game. But it's telling that the creators felt the need to include this element. I don't really think you can craft an ecosystem-centric story without themes of ecological destruction seeping in. Even Lost Ember, which takes place in a fantasy realm radically divergent from our own, subtly explores the tension between nature and humanity through its story of a fallen civilization. These are ideas you can't really escape, even if there's something only felt in the background. But in games with living ecosystems, the backgrounds become the foregrounds. I know this is an aspect of Red Dead that frustrated some people. I mean, the game is advertised as this action-centric cowboy adventure. And it is that, for some of the time. But at least 60% of this game is just riding your horse through natural vistas. On my first playthrough, that seemed like a weird allocation of time. But now, I'm not so sure. 
In environment-focused games, it is the backdrop, the minutia, and all those little pointless details that become the whole point. My experiences with these worlds have stayed with me. There's something I carry around in the jumble of my thoughts. Long after I pressed the power button and turned off these ecosystems for good, they've continued to have a life of their own. These worlds linger. They're alive. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support by liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.